Warning, you're about to hear unfiltered insights about regenerative agriculture and our sovereign right to natural food. This is not just a podcast, but a patriotic movement against the tide of food ignorance and corporate food giants shaping our modern food system. It's time to feed the people. AJ and Brooke. What's up, brother? What's up? I'm back. You're back. She's back. I was here last time. We just had I had some technical difficulties on my side, but we figured them out, didn't we, Brooks? We did, and it was embarrassingly simple, <laughs> as it oh, tends to be. Was it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're starting off the show with some technical knowledge about audio, ladies and gents. Sometimes you use what is known as a mixer. Mm. Brooke and I have the same mixer. It is the Rode Podcast uh, Podcaster. No, the, excuse me, the Rodecaster Pro. Mm-hmm. Okay, and on the Rodecaster Pro, you have channels where things like your microphone go and your headphones go. And when you connect that mixer to your computer, your computer is on a channel Mm -hmm. on your roadcaster, which we forgot to turn up as and have volume. So that's why she couldn't hear us (laughs) as we were. Yeah. I don't even know how it got turned down. Like I, you know what? I probably do know a lot of grandkids here. And when I put everything away, I leave my roadcaster just right where I'm sitting all the time. And I'm sure they get up there and they're like, ooh, what does this button do? What does this do? But the symbol on it is like a USB symbol. But that's not the type of cord that connects from the roadcaster to my computer. And it just never clicked. I remember looking at my right Bluetooth and that's not on. All right, cell phone, not connected to my cell phone. Well, I don't have USB (laughs) in there. And uh, anyways, we're back. Wow. Wah, wah, wah. That's funny. Well, we just uh, talked about stuff that got quite a bit of engagement, Brooks. Those are red and flags. I wish, I w- totally wish you were on that one, Brooke, because it would have been great I know. to have you. I was input. listening to it and I was like, yeah. oh, good episode. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It, but it had some, it had, it was perfect because we had mixed comments oh that was me sorry Happens we had to. mixed comments on that you know of course because and i just laughed told my wife i said anybody defending where we were at probably raised a beta boy and so they're trying to not feel guilty as a parent well the thing is <laughs> the thing is this we're not in the business to make you feel good nope we're not like mm-hmm. we're in the business of making us feel good like man you know taking care of our own mind our own body i mean i am on I'm a, on a one-way ticket train to try and get, get me feeling good. Mm. But that's the realization I have with my social media. I'm going to make people mad. And in fact, that's what I'm supposed to do. And if I'm not upsetting people, then I'm just playing to one side. Yeah, you're a cog in the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the way I would be playing to one side, even if, if I wasn't upsetting anybody, I wouldn't be helping at all. I wouldn't be upsetting anyone. Mm-hmm. I would just be here in the space floating around being like, hi, hey, Mm-hmm. I don't want to talk about anything real. Everything's no, great. We're talking about things real. That's what we're doing. Yeah. So if you're upset, good. Do some good. research. <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. Go read. Formerly known as reading. Yeah. <laughs> I saw somebody make that joke. I can't recall his Wait, name. It's not audio? mine. Yeah. So funny. Yeah. Read. read. Well, I'm excited about uh, that we're all back. That we're all back together. Mm-hmm. Thanks. As you guys can see, I'm in an unfinished uh, studio. It'll be it finished. It's the hat, though. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. This is something that AJ and I are sharing in common right now. We're both in some remodel. Uh, we got so many remodel plans. I'm remodeling a bathroom and my smile. I am down yet another <laughs> cosmetic tooth. I kind of I think I'm going to be a little sad when they're uh, so the remodel has begun, and in like uh, a couple of days, maybe one more week, there may be one more show. I'm pretty sure I should have it by the Wednesday before I leave on a short little trip. And uh, yeah, so I'm remodeling a smile and a bathroom. AJ's remodeling a house. Yep. In a way, yep. Brooke's remodeling her brain. 
I'm remodeling my yeah. body. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You just Nervous like, system. that's right. Mm-hmm. You know, you just go into the full reset. Sometimes you just got to rebuild to come back stronger. Yeah. It's the season. <laughs> I'm leaving, I'm leaving my rebuild in to JC. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the almighty. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. You got that I'm right. Just having faith and keep trying to be doing things healthier and better and pay attention to how I'm feeling. And you know what? All the things we're doing are good stuff. So as a whole, I have have no worries. I'm going to be just fine. That's right. And as a whole, we are remodeling our food supply chain. Yes. Oh my God. Oh my God, AJ. (laughs) Say that one. Man, that was good. (laughs) I pull them out every once in a while. It's your we, dad. Uh, it's the dad. Speaking of remodeling, we sold off our homestead when we thought we were leaving Cody. And so we've been rebuilding. We got nine chickens cruising in the backyard. Man, I haven't felt so happy. Dude, I'm in, so jealous. In, as this, in so long because I'm out moving chicken tractors, feeding, you know, setting up the infrastructure, getting all that stuff. And I'm just like, man, I miss this. I miss being a producer. There's something about working with your hands that's going to control. And when you go out in the morning and you grab some eggs out of there and you look at the girls, say, thanks girls. Here's some treats. Oh man. They're like, you're welcome. Yep. Yep. I'm going to pick up my farm fresh eggs today from this lovely woman up the road from me and my raw milk. Yeah, yeah. And I've gone carnivore. I'm doing carnivore for 10 days. My mom, my dad, and my sister and me. Awesome. So I am doing that, seeing if that kind of helps the whole system start feeling better too. And mm-hmm. I am I will just say, you know, this episode, we're gonna get into what we're really gonna talk about, but I will say <laughs> I'm so thankful and grateful for my parents because I live at home. I love my parents, we're best friends. But when I had, when I found out I had to cut out gluten, my mom was looking up recipes. She was buying stuff, gluten-free, everything. And then me, her, and my dad, we just eat it. Awesome. And then, this is funny. I called her when I was indisposed last week. And I was like, mom, I'm going to go carnivore. (laughs) I found out later she went into a full-on panic. She was like, starts researching, starts looking, (laughs) starts finding all the things about it. And, um... Yeah, me and her and my sister are doing carnivore. My dad's doing, well, we're both doing a version, I guess, because we're going to have dairy, some dairy and eggs. Mm -hmm. And my dad is like eating with us, but we're giving him some potatoes. You know, he's having his, we had burgers with avocado and um, fried egg on them last night. And he had some potatoes on the side and then he had ketchup and mustard on top. And I didn't do anything on mine. And he's like, oh, well, maybe if you sit close enough, you'll get a a (laughs) little splash. Yeah, I was like, I I said, Dad, you know, I would have a little if I wanted it, you know, but I don't need it. It's so good, what we were having. So good. That's awesome. We'll see. You know, we're going to do it for two weeks and then, depending on how I'm feeling, keep it going. Mm -hmm. And my sister, and so I'll report back. Yeah, do it. I heard that's done really well for the Petersons. Jordan Mm -hmm. and his, and his, uh, what's his daughter's name? Uh, uh, Kayla. Kayla? I think so. They had severe health issues and they are on strict carnivore, which is just meat, salt, and then fats. Mm. So no dairy, so no butter, yeah, right, but right. tallow, ghee, things like that. Um, but I just, I'm going to make my own butter. I'm like, dude, nice. I'm going to make my own butter. I've got tallow downstairs. I'm trying to be a little homesteader hallie hallie and brooke just be texting each other on the reg dude hallie's uh definitely her sour game her sourdough game has been elevated to a new level uh i think we're gonna be getting uh, you just know the chickens are on the way i don't know how you know i did you just know that they're on the way you can just feel it it's like yeah it's a sixth sense that i have as as the husband and 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 father is uh, chickens are inbound. And actually, you know, Brooke, something that you said that I was thinking about is like, you love living with your parents. And like, a lot of times you tell people like, oh, well, I'm going to go live with my parents. Like, oh, is everything okay? Mm-hmm. You know? And I'm like, oh, okay. I get that reaction. I get that reaction. But I'm just seeing, for, at least in our circles, a certain re- renaissance of taking joy of seeing your brothers and sisters and parents. And if you have them around grandparents, like, mm-hmm pretty regularly if not every single day in intimate moments and that being your squad like it is my sisters have become my best friends which is 
one of my favorite thing about finally moving home because I, and as soon as I got home, there were some signs, but uh, I was like, yep, this is actually where I'm supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And, and for me, but for my family, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm loving it out here. Way cool. And uh, we're going to get our garden started up at the ranch. So and- many people have a hard time wrapping their brain around the fact that like, like being comfortable with and loving being around your family. Cause so many people are uncomfortable around their families. Well, and some, you know, when I lived in California, my friends always thought it was so weird that I talked to my mom every day. <laughs> and it, all that did for me is like, make me realize like, man, I really have something that a lot of people don't like, uh-huh. here's yeah. all these people that are transplants. They moved from Michigan, moved from all over. They occasionally talk to their family and they occasionally see them. Mm-hmm. Mine's like, if, if I, if I went too long without talking to my mom, even Gina was like, you okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, Oh shit. Yeah. I should call her. Yeah. And it's just where I would get super busy, but we always just checked in. Cool. Love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Unexpected cool. great ramp. And we uh our regular scheduled program. Well, yeah, let's talk about the uh event we were at it a couple of weeks ago was the Utah Soil Health um Soil Health in the West conference is what it's called. It was their second annual Soil Health in the West conference. Yeah, look at you prepared. Yeah. I just figured, I, I definitely wrote some stuff down. And so I thought if mm-hmm. I needed a reminder or something to. Brooke's got notes, from. ladies and gentlemen. Brooke has got notes. Alert, alert, attention. <laughs> Love that. If I take I'm notes. Serious notes because uh, our family's operation. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you know, people, it's so funny. I think they think about, even when I say it, like what I want to do, like what I'm doing. Is exactly what I want to do and so much more in the industry of just Western life. But I want to be here with my dad. I want to be his person. I want to run the ranch. I want to learn everything about getting our soil health better. I want to move cows. You know, I'm going to do so many things. I want to do breakaway. I'm trying to do team roping. I'm trying nice. to show my horse. So yeah, everyone's, and I still exercise. If you guys are listening, you're like, wait, aren't you a CrossFitter? No, I'm not anymore. When I had a cervical fusion kind of took me out of the, the game for that. But I love being active. I love learning. And man, I love working with my hands and it just feels good. Mm. It's good. Being outside, yeah. digging in the dirt is good for your mental health. For sure. And your immune health, your immunity yes. health, and your uh, emotional health, mm-hmm. all of those things. Mm-hmm. You, yeah, mean, I, you mean things? I was at a yeah, here, go. Let's say it. Let's say it. <laughs> no. Do you remember uh, no. Joe Salatin when we first heard him at the uh, What Good Shall I Do conference? He said, mm-hmm. if you guys want a business idea that's going to be big, sell mats of farm dirt yes. to people in the city. Yep. He goes, they can just rub their feet on. They can rub their feet in it. They can get those microbes attached to their skin and they can absorb those and that will wow. help them be healthy. And I was like, dude, I wouldn't want the task of marketing that, but that's mm-hmm. a cool idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, but it's true. Like he calls it your viral load, like your immune system. Like we, when we went to St. George while we were consult, while I was doing my work down there consulting um, for the last six or seven months, Family went down to St. George. Granted, we were in a trailer, but we weren't living the life we were here in Cody. When we were here in Cody, we did not get sick once. None of us. None of us got sick. We were messing with goats and cows and chickens, playing in the river, all of those things. We went to St. George, and man, we were sick every month. It was crazy. So, it, we're much healthier out here. And we're pretty oh, my little it. nephew. Um He's not that little, but my sister's youngish, his twins, Deegan, just the funniest kid. I mean, and a ladies man, he's liked girls since he was two years old. <laughs> when he could talk, it was like, they had a friend, her name was little Lexi, called her little Lexi. Cause his older sister, my niece is Lexi. Well, he picks his nose and he's a fierce athlete. I mean, all my nieces and nephews are dude, but he picks his nose. And my sister was saying this, we're in the car. And she's like, she's always getting after him. Deegan, get your finger out of your nose, right? I'm on the soccer field, like in the <laughs> middle of a game. And she tells him, she goes, you know, if you keep doing that, your girls probably aren't going to like you. But she goes, but actually, 
that kid never gets sick ever, mm-hmm. never, ever does not get sick. And she goes, and I think it has to do with him and his, his <laughs> obsession with his nose. <laughs> I'm like maybe. That's funny. Well, the uh, the further away you get from the from the soil and from the mm-hmm. uh, the the natural living, the you're putting things in your nose that are not good. But that kid's in the dirt all the time, and he's putting mm-hmm. it in his nose, and it's and like, oh, this is dirt, so. Yeah. There's almost like an inherent. Oh my god, are we bad? Is there an inherent biological like mechanism for kids to put things in their nose because maybe. it actually helps their immunity? Oh my maybe, I mean, god! You know, women that are pregnant that get like a super Holy cow. Holy cow. Because they're deficient in something. You know, you've heard about that. I mean, things happen for a reason, you know, and that, and and the finger in the nose is a, is a widespread finger in the nose is a widespread thing. (laughs) This isn't, I mean, come on, who doesn't, who doesn't find their self digging for gold in there every now and again? It's just a natural thing. Sometimes you you have to breathe. And it's like, get things out and then put things in. I, uh, there is something to that, Brooke. <laughs> I was getting dressed to go, me and my sister worked out this morning. Then we got in the pool for our cold plunge. Cause it was 51 degrees. My little niece, Maisie, she's three. She's at my door where she's following me upstairs. I go, all right, you're not coming in my room though. It's messy. I got to clean it. And I don't want you putting your hands in all my stuff. So she stands, she sits at my door and she kneels down and she's just digging and she eats it. And I go, oh, you picking your nose? She goes, yeah. And I go, was it good? She goes, yeah. <laughs> Tastes good? Mm-hmm. I'm like, You're not my kid? Pick away. <laughs> That's so funny. When we got back, so we, we, girls have been back. My wife and kids have been back for a week. And I got back Friday night. Two nights ago, maybe three nights ago, if, uh, if you're listening, you go see my social media. My kids. Mm-hmm. I'm, it's so awesome. It was 14 degrees and they are out by the Creek building a fire and cooking hot dogs and just building forts. I have daughters. Dude, that's what I not, did. That's, so how I, that's how I grew up, dude. Yeah. We, in our neighborhood, even we had a very fantastic neighborhood. It was a circle, big circle. And the entire neighborhood was filled with families with kids. And all of the families had kids of the same age. So that's like, awesome. your siblings grew up with certain kids. I grew up with the younger kids, but there was always vacant lots. Yep. We dug and we mm-hmm. built. Yeah. Forward. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that thing I posted on Instagram with a guy talking about being a a '90s baby or a '80s, whatever it was, and he says, you know, your parents basically would just tell you to go outside, and don't come back in, go play, don't come inside. They didn't really care where you were. Go outside. Yep. We never stayed inside, man. The only mm-hmm. video game I had was my brother's, and it was Duck Hunt, and it was epic. Yeah. Yeah. And, but we didn't play video games. We didn't do nothing like that. We were outside all the time. Yeah. And that's awesome. what you got to get back to, man. Well, and I, I'm like the oldest of five boys. So now that I have girls, I'm like, oh, they like this shit too. That's mm-hmm. great. <laughs> so now I'm like, let me encourage more of that, you know? And then my daughter, my youngest, she's like, dad, I did my first cold plunge on my own tonight. Cause we've got this river that falls in and chipped it away. And she's like, I did my first cold plunge by myself tonight. I was like, yes, that's freaking awesome. But they, uh, uh, you know, mom's a little more reserved, you know, when it comes to like dangerous stuff and I'm dad's like, go figure it out, rub some dirt on it. But they, my daughter's like, can we build a fire and cook hot dogs? And I'm like, it was like, there was snow everywhere. There's, and I, I fought wildfires for three years. Like I know fire behavior and so forth. And I'm like, yeah, there's, first of all, if you can get it started, I'm going to be super proud because everything's wet. So go for it. Second of all, it is not going anywhere. It will not spread. And, um, I'm like, yeah, you can do that. She's like, okay, good. Cause earlier we built a fire and cooked hot dogs already on the, yeah, top, we already of the did it. yeah on uh, top of the, on top of the pond. And I was like, on top of the pond, that's cool. Yeah. So they walked down <laughs> and showed me around. I was just so proud that proud as a dad that I can give them that right. When it's so rare, especially where everything's being urbanized and then just proud that they have, they chose to do that versus being on their, their iPads or phones. They don't have iPhones, but their iPads all day. So it was cool. It was really neat. And they're learning skills. Yeah. I loved watching that video. Yeah. They learned skills. The fact that they started a fire with no accelerant with the moisture, the way it was, uh, you know, they've been taught, you know, small kindling and then you build up and add bigger things and they were out there and they stayed out there for like four hours. I mean, it was nine o'clock nine. Well, 
they came in for dinner sometime around 7.30 or 8. And they'd already been out for hours. And they ate dinner, got dressed, and went right back outside. They had one of their friends over. And I'm like, yes, this is exactly what I want my kids to have. So, but uh, let's digress. So, Soil uh, (laughs) soil Health Conference. um, You know, it was really cool for me is, so I spoke at that event three, uh, the first, the first one, two years prior, when we were just kind of getting the app going and they had me speak on like selling direct and those kinds of things. And we were talking about, and, and, and during that time, my focus and it's, and it's, I'm going to start messaging this again, cause it's necessary. And it's a message of collaboration and abundance. You know, when a producer says the best beef, what they're saying is other people suck. And what I'm trying to get people to understand is it's not the best, it's just yours. It's your family's process. Teach people about you and your family. Don't don't diminish other people's work by trying to say yours is the best. Because frankly, it doesn't matter. Well, Consum- and it's up to it's up to a consumer to decide. Yeah. Like people mm-hmm. don't like the same type. They don't like the same leanness or fattiness, right. or I mean, everyone is it's objective. You know? Yeah. So it's good. It's yep. healthy and it gets the job done. That's right. It fills That's your right. freezer. Yep. So we, so I kind of, I started out with the joke. It's a room full of, you know, farmers and ranchers. And I said, if you get three, and I actually stole this from a cro- the CrossFit world. If you get three ranchers in the room, the only thing two are going to agree on is how the third one doesn't know how, what he's doing. That, I heard that in the coaching space. You get three coaches in a room and the only thing too, because there's always this. And I think that's probably the same thing for every industry, which is unfortunate. That's where you get in the scarcity versus abundance. Right. And so anyway, so that was two years ago. And I had learned about uh, Alejandro Carrillo and um, Alan Savory and these people that I don't know how to turn off these AI filter things, but I'll figure it out anyway. <laughs> There might be fireworks going off at some point. Uh, so watching these guys, oh, and and uh, Neil Spackman, who who through marriage were related, but Neil, re- re- these people are re-greening deserts where we think global warming or desertification is finite, and it's not. It's actually a problem of management. Typically in the West here in the U.S., it's because of the Bureau of Land Management. 100%. The original BLM. And they have been tasked telling people how to manage their land, which typically looks like this. Oh, you're in a dry environment. Uh, You can only have one cow-calf pair, that's mama and baby, per 100 acres. They, it's so stupid because when these people who are actually re-greening deserts look at it and say, uh, that's because you should probably have 30. I'm I'm making this number up. It's, it's in context, right? But one- my yeah. dad just went to the, mm-hmm. just had to go to the water meeting. Yes. So he's like, he hates going to him, but they always put him on the board. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he came home and he said, and I, I don't remember exactly, but they're changing some water rights rules. And uh, the only way to maintain what you have is it has to be old water. Yeah. I go, dad, is our old, is ours old enough? He goes, yep. It's like 1940. Yeah, And then more water we're actually trying to buy next, which is way overpriced, but it's also just as old. So I'm like, okay, but that's really upsetting. Mm-hmm. Because like, anyone wanting to homestead. Yeah. Good luck with water. Yeah. Because anywhere in that land, you have to pay for power. You got to bring power and you got to bring the road and you got to build the road. You got to bring water and you got to dig your well. It is not a cheap thing to do, Mm-mm. you know? And it's so frustrating when the state is making it even more difficult. And it's like, what makes me so ashamed, and I'm sure you feel the same, AJ, is that's just not, it's not who we are here. Nope. You know, that's not how you do things here, but it's nope. how you do it now. And uh, I'm so grateful that um we have old water. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm reading this book. I'm going to show it on the screen, but I'm sure you guys can clip it in. It's called Red Famine. Red Famine by Anne Applebaum. It is about the Holodomor, which I bring up often, but now I'm actually diving in to get some of the, you know, like this is a 15 hour book and it's, I was like, is that a boom? (laughs) That was not the right timing, bro. (laughs) But it is, it's a 15 hour book on the, the, everything that led to 
Holodomor stands for death by starvation, essentially. That's what it means. 1932 to 33 in Ukraine. This was during Stalin's reign, during Lenin's reign. So what you're talking about, Brooke, is similar to what they dealt with, which was poor policy. And they forced what, because they were communists, they forced what they call collective, the collectivization or the collective farming. Well, when you're a producer and you don't get to reap the rewards of what you sow, you're not reaping what you sow because it just gets taken away. Guess what goes down? Production. Because why would I be busting my ass? First of all, I can barely survive because I'm now only getting back food that you deem I can have. And so I don't have the energy because I'm not, I'm not well fed to go and manage the land, manage the livestock, do all of those things. And you're going to take it all away and go distribute it amongst the people in the city. So I think what's happening is we're seeing, you know, change the, change the dates and change the names, the actors, and we're starting to see the same thing. So when the Bureau of Land Management says, you know, when, when we start complaining, when the supply chain breaks and we have no food, you're going to point fingers at government agencies like the Bureau of Land Management that limited the number of livestock allowed to be on the land. If I have, you know, only one cow per 100 acres, that, that's a problem. That means I'm not growing enough food. Now, the management practices are designed in a way that create organic matter. And this is a lot of what we learned in the program or at the at the soil health, but you're adding organic soil organic matter back to the soil, which then produces more forage so you can actually run more cattle. And um, more water. And then, yeah. Well, and we are, if we're like restricting water. Um, yes. There's a solution. Yeah. It's been proven. Yeah. You like know? up at, up in the Escalante Desert that where you guys border. I don't know if they consider it Escalante Desert, but you're definitely we're bordering not, it. But we are okay. right on there, yeah. Yep. The Escalante Desert, uh, we're trying to get rainwater harvesting laws changed because we can't drill wells. The aquifers are depleting. But here's what's happening. The top of the soil has become so hard and crusted, soil imp- uh, compaction, because we don't have what they call the mycelia network, you know, the, the fungal network that keeps it open and aerated so that when it does rain, rain can soak through and fill the aquifers. They don't allow you to collect more than 2,500 gallons per parcel, which means it's a stupid lazy law. Cause if I have a five acre parcel, I can collect 2,500 gallons. If I have a 500 acre parcel, I can collect 2,500 gallons. So what we're trying to say is change the law to state that you can capture however much rainwater you want, as long as it's used on the land, it was captured because that'll give us the ability to put it into production on the land, which will then create organic matter in the soil Increased soil organic matter by 1% will hold an extra 20,000 gallons of water. And then guess what? It's going to sink into the soil, hit the aquifer, and replenish the aquifer. Just give me one reason why we can't have rainwater. Yeah. You know Profitability I mean? and health are the Weird. Weird. Oh, now, you know, uh, home gardens are bad. Well, you know what? Your fake meat. Uh, Bill Gates are actually giving you boobs. So <laughs> I just here's so the mad. reason. Here's the reason, bro. Profitability and health actually are at odds. Just one more time. Profitability and health actually are at odds. Odds. That's that is literally the one reason why you can't collect rainwater mm-hmm. and yep. and they oh you you, you want to be profitable sorry profitability and health are actually at the odds. Other, upper room yeah where we found out that the army corps of engineers are the ones putting up the biggest fight for people accessing water which is a rabbit hole i don't have time to go down but uh, well i might I'm just going to use the word indoctrination. Okay. That's all I like to, as much as I can, any, anything to do with our military people that aren't in charge. I try to just think uh, manipulation and brainwashing. And I'm going to go with that <laughs> Yeah. because military, you know, mm-hmm. you assume they think for themselves, but actually only probably certain groups would still be able to do that. And if you had the right people leading you, yeah. it'd be really easy going through all that training 
Yeah, because thinking for yourself and military have gone so much cool together. So much work, just like CrossFit. You you get really good at being comfortable when you are so uncomfortable. Yep. You know, that's one thing why I think I probably didn't really think too much about when I was going to have an issues or signs of my cervical, mm-hmm. my severely herniated disc. I was yep. so used to being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It became very difficult to know what kind of pain was bad. Oh yeah. You, you can, you can teach yourself how not to feel. That was mm-hmm. one of the skill sets that you can learn in that sport is yeah. learning how not to feel. Um, so AJ, <laughs> So the so day one of the soil health conference. No, just <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me yeah. just say this. So Aleandro, so two years ago I got to speak there, and then I'm talking to local producers in the Utah area about regenerative agriculture, mostly family, but it typically felt on fell on deaf ears because they were hearing about regenerative agriculture from like white Oaks pastures with Will Harris and, and Gabe Brown um, up at his ranch in North Dakota. And so they were associating regenerative agriculture with climates that got more rain. And so I I had so, and because I'm not a producer and frankly, when I was talking to my family, I'm just the city slicker nephew. So what do I really know about agriculture? Um, it, It just, it wouldn't penetrate. Nobody would hear it, but when you study Alejandro Carrillo, who's in the Chihuahua desert of Mexico and, um, and uh, Alan Savory in South Africa, th- that, that was who actually introduced me to regenerative agriculture. So I'm like trying to, I'm like, okay, you're never going to hear it from me. So two years ago, I set out to someday create an opportunity for Alejandro to come to the deserts of Southern Utah. And that's what happened. And so I actually got to go down to the Las Vegas airport and pick him up. He's become a friend of mine over the years, you know, just texting here and there. And so I offer him like, can I, can I pick you up from the airport? So myself and the two guys were working on the uh, regeneration project in the Escalante desert. They came down with me. And so we got basically a, an hour and 45 private master class with the master of regreening the desert, which was so incredible. But I told him, I said, listen, you're here to create miracles. Like I put this in the universe that you are going to be in Southern Utah, because when they hear from a man from the Chihuahua desert, who is living it and doing it with four inches of rain a year, even more than that, because Mm -hmm. he comes from a background of ranching of cow. You know what I mean? Like he's not someone who's jumped in the space and is like, I care about soil health and you guys are all doing it wrong. No, 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 no. He lived it. He lived he, it in the wild west down there yes. and he lived it and he worked it with his dad and because of his dad, dad's profession, profession or how he looked at things, it was just easy for them to be like, yeah, we could try something new. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. That's and it. that's, it's because his, his, he said, my dad didn't buy the ranch until I was 18. And then his dad brought him to the ranch. So I think he was about 70 years old. He was living in Miami working in technology. So they, what they didn't have are those words rattling around in the heads that says, this is how my dad always did it, or this mm-hmm. is how it's always been done. So when new information came along, they're like, Oh yeah, let's try that. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it flourished. And so I, so I'm like, you know, miracles are going to happen in the desert because you're here. And he, he's like, Oh yeah, no pressure. <laughs> but from a guy who just traveled Australia, there was no, he was joking. Cause there is no pressure when, so when you know that it's factual, what you're teaching is factual. Do this, get this. Where's the pressure? It's up to you or the listener to move the filters and adopt what you're hearing and make it happen. Something that I think was probably for me and and making an assumption, but assuming for a lot of people in our area, it was the most valuable is the fact that it is. And he says that it is not one size fits all. So if you guys are, if you got, if you're out there and you're all gung ho about regenerative and you think that's the only way, and there's only one way to do it, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Plain and simple. You are wrong. Stop tearing people down that are doing something different than you. Yep. And that's like a big message that I have. And I talk to people. Yes, we need to focus on our soils, but you know what we need to focus on more maintaining producers. Yes. Forget about how they're, what their finishing protocol is. Mm-hmm. Forget where they're at. Forget what they're, whatever you are a hundred times more likely to get a healthy product from your own producer, then going to the grocery store. If you care about your health, stop going to the grocery store. 
Yep. Take care about your children's health. Stop going to the grocery store. Stop giving them all the processed foods just because they like it. And the, the amount of times that I hear, they just don't, won't eat anything. It's like, you're the parent. <laughs> I'm an aunt. And I can tell you that. Control it. Because all yeah. that happens, like you look at little kids that are childhood obesity. That is child abuse, dude. And you are changing them, like the, their system to where you are setting them up for a very hard life, not only emotionally, but health wise. Mm-hmm. So put your foot down, stop getting angry and keeping us at odds as producers. No, we got to come together. So I loved that because he just gave so much information and was so straightforward, but he has the background of like knowing what it's like to work the land. And now he has the background of knowing what it's like to try something different, work on it, and then see that it worked. Yes. But never once did he ever even talk about the, like almost like criminalizing the old way of how they did it. He never right. did. Nope. You're so right too. It's, it is about maintaining our producers and not losing any more because that's, that's worse. Like if you're, I may not eat beef that's out of a feedlot. That's a personal decision. I do not fault you for finishing cattle in a feedlot, which by the way, let me just say this little, uh, uh Colorado craft beef. We had those, we had Jeff on the show. Um, he sent me a box of steaks. I've never had a better T-bone in my life than what he sent me. <laughs> it's like a treat. You know what I mean? Cause it's it. Oh my gosh. We, we didn't even put it on plates. I literally just cut it up in little cubes on the plate and everybody was just picking at it. And by the time all three were gone, uh, cut up, they were gone. It was so good. But I eat regenerative beef for the, the essential amino acids and the phytonutrients and so forth. But I have no problem promoting Jeff and what he and his family are doing at Colorado craft because they're producing food for American families as a small American family owned company. Well, and I think it's very important for people to realize there are so many nuances that unless you're in it, you don't know. Right. You know what I mean? Like for instance, us, Mm -hmm. when we ought to bring our cows down because winter and we don't have winter range because it's so hard to get any land out here You know, we have big corrals where our cows go and we never even have more than like 14 head because we only really raise for our family. Mm. We feed out with our hay that my dad grows. We got one ton bales that comes down and that is what's being fed out. And they get a small supplementation of a grain. And that's the way my family does it. And that's the way we like to eat it. And it is good, healthy beef, no vaccines, no hormones, nothing. They are open pasture raised. The entire time we have them, they're brought down for about two months. You know what I mean? Like, so when you yeah. do, when you do hear about a, um, a ranch and you're like, oh, well, is it corn finished? Yeah. Well, maybe look at like, find out what their finishing protocol is and see what their mm-hmm. whole life looks like. Because if yeah. you're buying grass fed beef at the store, well, we've all learned that to market something grass fed, it only has to be on grass 50% of its life. Mm-hmm. And then what do they do? Feed lot. Yep. So... Yeah. Label laws, label laws are very confusing to the consumers that have no clue. That's and why so, I see the rule of thumb is know your producer. Yes. Y'all yeah, remember that question. And then go from there. Y'all like, remember that little business and then go from there. As coaches, we probably said like, you know, if you're going to have treats, make it yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's like if yeah. you're growing the hay that you're finishing your own cows with, I think you're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a pretty high standard. <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah, well, we grew the hay, you know, it's like, uh, all right. You know, like, why would any rational person shake their nose or turn, turn their nose up at that finish, yep. you know, uh, yep. or something similar? Yeah, like, yeah, I mean, as a average consumer uh, of well, I'm beyond average consumer of, of beef, but as an average person uh, learning about the industry through you both or facilitating that learning and offering me avenues of, uh, you know, gathering knowledge and, and information, I have come around very quickly to AJ's position of we need more producers. We need more people getting to know their farmers and seeing the operations up close. And it is just the logical answer to create a resilient economy of food and food supply chain. It's just the logical next step because it doesn't remove the other options from the table. It just increases the opportunities 
for the marketplace. Mm -hmm. There's literally no downside that I can think of outside of somebody being intentionally negligent as a producer. And even if they were to do that, marketplaces tend to, you know, that information tends to get around and they stop being a producer. It's a very short, short thinking type of game. Um, And yeah, like I, uh, my farmer, uh, it's Rhodes Farm. This is where I get my meat regularly. Rhodes Farm, old Freddie out in uh, Salisbury, Tennessee. Okay. Nice. And he, yeah, they finished with grain and corn. But like, yeah, he didn't even know that there were other options to pasture. Like he was confused by the question. One thing that that Alejandro said, he stood up there and he said, America does not have a metabolic disease issue because of beef that's finished on grain. It is your American diet. Yeah. Everything else you're eating. So to attack yeah. The beef industry, cow farts, all the other bullshit that we've talked, you know, that they've claimed and they continue to claim. It's just, you're not using your whole brain, mm-hmm. you know, like what are you eating? Most people are eating steak or hamburgers for one meal a day. Yeah. Dinner. What do you have in all the in-betweens? Yeah. What's your breakfast? What's your lunch? What's your snacks? What are the kids eating at school? Okay. So there are so many other things you can control before we start attacking something that is almost the pure, like it is the most purest thing you can even have is knowing your producer that's raising that cow. So AJ, how, how would you rate uh, the receptivity of Alejandro's speech this time around? Uh, Well, so he wasn't there the first time. This was the first time there. Um, Everybody I talked to that went to the field day, they were blown away. They went out to, um, the Iverson ranch in hurricane. And they were just blown away with the knowledge he was sharing. It was standing room only in the, in his keynote speech on the last day. I know we didn't get in there. Yeah. You got you and cam were grabbed a seat up against the wall. Cause they, I mean, it was, it was, it was standing room only. And I would say oh, actually, it was, sorry, sorry. I was thinking about the day before. Oh yeah. Right. Cause yeah. We, we didn't go yeah. that day. So we're going to go the next day. Cause it was, standing room only. Yeah. He had a breakout session in one of the conference rooms and we couldn't even fit. It was standing room only. And we just were like, God oh, damn it. We didn't get there soon enough. But his, his keynote day on the end, it was very, it, the intention that was set by myself. And I'm so grateful for Tony Richards at, um, at the Utah soil health division uh, for the state to, to, bring him in um, because really that's what it, I didn't bring him in. I just had to plant some seeds and then the money had to be paid by the state and Tony and his team had to do all the work to set it all up. But I think we will see miracles happening in the next five to 10 years in Southern Utah because of the introduction. And I just want to go back to something real quick that to echo what Brooke was saying about, about the, the, the finishing program and so forth. We, we sat, Brooke and I sat in a confer, uh, in one of the sessions with a gentleman named Dr. Stefan Van Fleet. Oh, amazing. And we will have him on here. He's a, he actually is at Utah state university studying the impact of, of uh, well, it's the biggest study that's ever been done in, in, in complexity. And so what they are doing is they're studying soil health and its relation to plant health. And then they're studying plant health in its relation to uh, yeah. animal health, so livestock. And then they're studying livestock health and its relation to meat quality health, and then meat quality health and its relation to human health. Usually, uh, an organization will focus on just one of those tiers, and they won't put it all together. And what was interesting is he said the 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 research is clear that when an animal has a highly nutritious diversity of species of grasses it has a much higher phytonutrient essential amino acid uh and omega-3 to 6 profile ratio like much higher Mm -hmm. but what he did say what i thought was interesting is they're actually now looking at if an animal's fed that for its whole life until like the last 30 to 60 days and then given corn and grain there's There's actually evidence positives yes there's There's actually possible evidence to show that Yep, that it's that's not going to affect it negatively on the nutritional scale, but only add value. And and they don't. It's still early. Go ahead. You've, well, he you've he helped. talked a a big reason why he didn't. He was for it in a sense, and it all just came back to again the nuances of where are you? You're a producer. Where? Because with bison, with with beef in the winter, 
they lose weight. Mm. They can't keep weight on them. Yep. So it's also an effort during those winter months when they can't be grazing to supplement with a grain or corn or something because there's positives in the vitamin realm. There's way more with grass fed, but you almost can find the best of both worlds. And he said, and the, the weight they lose and the little bit, you know, using a grain to help balance that out through the winter months and then getting them back into free range, depending on how long you have them. If you have a cow calf operation or whatever, it kind of figures itself out. That sounds like yeah. humans. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. You, you, uh, you balance out in the winter time with the things that are available that are like dry goods and root vegetables, you know, like you balance mm-hmm. out your, you know, you, you get the things where you can. And then when everything's abundant, then you can like refresh and replenish, you know, and then summertime comes and everything's fruiting. So it's like, it would make sense to feed your animals in a seasonal way, just like we would feed ourselves in a seasonal way, because that's likely the closest representation or re, re, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, but it's like, uh, 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 uh. Y'all help me out. It's like the, yeah, it's the best way to simulate the real natural yes. wild experience. Yes. Yeah. Here, here was something else that was fascinating. Cause I went and, you know, after he was done talking, I, I just I had some questions for him that didn't kind of fit the whole, you know, asking the questions in front of everybody. Cause they were side sidebar questions, but I asked him about research being done on the impact of uh, feed like corn and grain that had been sprayed with glyphosate and if they had done any research on whether or not that was being passed along into the meat because the issue is now glyphosate's a major problem uh it is causing lymphoma uh non-hodgkin's lymphoma i mean that's that all the evidence is there but that's when you're so so i asked him and he said that the animal seems to be able to filter glyphosate out so it hasn't there is no evidence that it's transferring to the meat product fascinating the difference though is if you're eating grains uh cereals things like that that were sprayed with there's no filter process it's soaked in that stuff so if you're eating that but but it it seems as if you're if you're eating meat that was you know from an animal that was fed those things that part is filtered out now a lot of people say, well, what about GMOs? We don't, I don't know that yet. I'm definitely going to have Stefan Van Fleet join our podcast so we can, you know, go deep and ask, ask our, our uh, patrons to send questions that they have. Cause this is the guy to talk to oh, his, yeah. his, his career started in human nutrition and then it evolved into animal nutrition and its impact on human nutrition. So what a great, what, what better person to do that? Matter of fact, some of the reports that I've seen on regenerative, Nutrient density comes from the Bionutrient Institute, which is somehow he's associated to that. And I was like, oh, cool. Connecting the dots. I'm like, fantastic. You know, like I, my, my good buddy out here in, in Wyoming, RC, we've had him on the show. RC Carter has regular back and forth conversations with Stefan Van Fleet. And RC was one of the people uh, from Carter Country Meats that sent their meat to the Bionutrient Institute to be tested and came back with those 75% increase in nutrients. What RC is trying to promote, little sidebar, and, and I love this, rather than on the label promoting finishing program, which is so bullshit anyway, it should promote nutrient density. I'm like, brilliant, because then it doesn't matter if it's corn and grain finished, if it's grass fed and finished, if it's regenerative finished, you're simply buying the product based off the nutrient content. Talk about the right way to purchase something and when it comes to our food. Well, and what he mentioned about that is um, because of the amount of, well, sorry, the amount of data that we, they do have, we're a little far off from them doing that on a big scale. But the things that he thinks you can feel really comfortable about, you know, marketing or putting on your label is about your omegas. Mm, Yeah, that's right. But a lot of the more like when he, cause he got really into the science, right. And all of the things like we went over, it was epic. Yeah. It was a really wonderful talk. Um, but he basically said like, we're a little bit further away from producers, like that being something that could be a standard or that will, I don't know if maybe, you know, the guys in the upper, upper room 
would somehow kibosh that. Mm-hmm. But focusing on if you are doing the studies on your meat and you can show your omegas, your ratio, I mean, that right in and of itself should really be a huge selling point for people. Well, what was killing people in COVID? It, COVID wasn't killing healthy people. Now, if you got the jab, you died later, but COVID itself wasn't killing healthy people. And the people that was killing were people that had high inflammation from their diet. They were heavy in omega-6s, so they were inflamed versus omega-3s, so they weren't inflamed. Makes perfect sense that that's where we would start with labeling. Yeah. It wasn't until the jab that you saw athletes going down. Yep. They were like, oh man, uh, we got to get rid of these strong, you know, (laughs) strong minded, physically active people. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Bro, so, what? <laughs> we, 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 conspiracy we, for we, we went there. We've got to slide those in, man. That's what we do. Friggin' frogs gay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. If you guys are offended that I'm laughing right now, I'm the type of person that I laugh through horrible realities that I'm faced with in my life. It's like yeah. the best way to get through it because there's no point in being there's no point in letting yourself stress over things you can't control. But when it's still happening and you see it happening, you're seeing the stupidity. You got to laugh at it. Mm-hmm. Before we started the show, I was explaining to Brooke and AJ uh, my imagined future where I'm a little more direct with the things that I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I'll just say this for now. It doesn't surprise me that trying to do something like put real information on a label is going to receive pushback. Yeah. yeah. We'd rather talk. Yeah. You'd rather put things on there that don't matter because what, what are we going to try to inform the American public about nutrients? We can't have that. We can't have to even put it on the label would be to highlight that it's something to be considered Mm -hmm. and we can't have nutritional density to be considered because then all of the label law tricks that are being used to convince you that you're eating something that's healthy. It's got vitamin A, C, K, D. It's got, you know, added this and added that. It's like, that's probably the least nutrient dense food you could possibly eat. Otherwise you wouldn't have to fill it with a bunch of stuff. That's not already in it. It has no, no nutritional density, which is why you have to. So I'm such a nut and it's not a sure. Fine. It's a conspiracy hypothesis that I have that even that it is one of the ways to keep people in the dark is you just don't even let them know it's an option. No, exactly. And, and it, you know, the word conspiracy now nowadays is truth. That is what it means. Conspiracy equals truth. Um, AJ, why don't you let our listeners know where they can go very soon and they can get that information. And they don't have to worry about labels that are made from a government institution. You know, there's no one monitoring them. The people that will be monitoring. Are we going to get it from the farm update? Huh? Yes. All right. We're going to. All right. All right. Uh, uh, same, similar song. New bit. We're going to from the farm update with AJ. Dear listener. From the Farm is going to be what this podcast is called, starting episode 20. There, I spoiled it. We're getting aligned with the vertical, that is the beautiful app, the From the Farm app that is in progress, in process, and coming to you soon. Oh, how exciting. You'll be able to reach out, shake the hand that feeds you, get to know your producers. And we have the two leading the charge here, leading this podcast which is currently called feed the people but will soon be known and reminded to be rebranded to be known as the from the farm podcast so this is our from the farm update from our dear friend our tinfoil hat beauty (laughs) aj richards take him away aj all right i love it i'm glad we're changing the name you know when it comes to managing all these different names it's, it's, it's a lot. So we should just be from the farm because it's yeah. what we do. Feed the people, serve its purpose as we are getting the momentum, getting, getting going. Don't be surprised if something, we end up coming up with something else down the road using that. So mm-hmm. we oh, still yeah. got it. We're but. still keeping ownership of the feed the people by the people. And, and feed the people energy was like, we're going to punch some people in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> 
we were like that energy going away i don't I'm see it you know? yeah we're, we're just that was why that's why we had to get down here Yep. Yeah. And so from the farm, <laughs> from the farm, it's pastures. It's nice. It's like, it's approachable. You know, we can punch people in the mouth on our own, in our own spare time. What we're trying to do is invite people into this beautiful ecosystem that is from the farm. You get in your uh, beef and you get in your eggs and your milk and your sourdough and all those things. Like that's the, that's the vibe this that we're is going how for. We, this is how you red pill yourself. We, yeah. you know, <laughs> we get to completely exit the food model and unlike the movie we get we get to get to exit it and we get to create a community of people that are working together helping one another we are you know we think we you know we believe in the same things we want the same things health happiness families sovereignty and like easy comfortable you know pasture living here's the talked about psyop about the matrix are you ready Yes. When you take the red pill, you wake up in a freaking mechanical hellscape. It's scary. It's terrifying. You get you get all the the the, the liquid sucked down. You're shot through this freaking tube and tunnel, and that's what you imagine it to be like. Actually, it's green freaking pastures and cows and babies and, and and good joints and family dinners. You know that's what happens when you get red pilled. Actually. Yes, because yes. we're creating that place for you. If you have already been red pilled, then I and, and if you got red pilled, you're not hanging out on the deep what forms. That, that feels like because you, when you wake up, there's a lot. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to just. It took me a little bit of time to find my happy medium of like staying aware, without letting it feel like I got to do something. You know, and what we were able to turn that into is what me and AJ are doing. Mm -hmm. We're turning it into something. So you, the reality we're faced with, the truths, they're hard truths and it sucks, you know, but it's, but it is what it is. So if you got the jab and you're like, I wish I didn't, we wish you didn't too, but it's okay. It is what it is. We can't change it, but we are creating a system that can hopefully help you stay healthier and battle that out, you know? So we are creating greener pastures. Yeah. We, we, we all know people that chose to get the jab for one reason or another. And I don't judge any of them. Most of them are my, some of them are my real close personal fan. Like me too, a brother and, and somebody else just as close. I don't want to put them on blast, but I get it. They had their own reasons. I didn't. And, uh, I'm glad I didn't. And I'm always worried about my family that did, but I don't judge them for it. They had Reason, one of them did it to keep his job, and I don't blame him. He was 16 years in, was not gonna, was not gonna risk losing a retirement, and you know, uh, anyway. So, so yeah, we 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 make no judgment. I don't, we don't make judgment if you come from a vegan or vegetarian background. Matter of fact, we will have food producers on there that are growing vegetables for vegans. Mm-hmm. Great. What I will have a problem with, and I'll put my feed the people, buy the people energy behind it is if you have a problem that I eat meat, we don't, we don't want you there. I mean, I'm going to just say that right now. We will fire a customer. <laughs> I know. If you have a problem with us choosing f- with food freedom and food sovereignty, meaning I, as a sovereign individual can choose whether I eat meat or not, I don't want you around me. We're not going to have any of that energy in our space. But if you believe that I get to choose for myself and for whatever reason you have chosen that you don't eat meat, God love you. Cause I do too. So, Feed the people update uh, uh, from the farm update. <laughs> it's all right. It's the first day. Yes. We are in the process right now of testing the technology. So it's built. It is ready to go. As soon as we say, turn it on, the tech team will turn it on and the server is live. We're going through process. We're, right now we're setting up a bunch of fake farms and ranches so that, um, we can test bugs and the and we've got a bunch of volunteers that reached out from social media that have ju- to, you know said they want to help us out and so they're setting up fake farms they're sending us bug reports like hey I, this was confusing i didn't know what the next step was or this didn't quite work so we're working with every with a bunch of people right now to uh, work out as many of the kinks as possible here's what i want people to know if you are a patient person 
We're excited to serve you. We'll be live in two weeks. This is what we call an MVP. It means minimum viable product. Essentially, we put just enough money behind it to get it started so that we could then see if what they say in, in, in I guess, the business world, if the market demanded it. Product market fit is what it's known as. Now, we already know because of everybody listening and people on social media that are backing us and telling us, God bless you. Uh, thank you. I mean, we had a girl duet one of my videos on TikTok and was in tears because she was so worried about where our food supply chain is heading. So we already know there's product market fit. Now it's up to us to tweak the tech. So if you're patient, be patient with us. You're hearing the founders talking, you know, God has called us to get involved in this, not because we know the industry. We are not tech people. And isn't it funny that typically that's how God works, you know? And so it's been a journey of personal growth for myself. It's a journey of personal growth for Brooke and faith for that. And anybody involved with us, now we're seeing momentum where we can make a phone call to somebody and share what we're doing. And they're like, oh yeah, we're in. Like early on, it was like, eh, eh, but now... Four years later, when they see the writing on the wall, the red famine that's show that's that's right at our doorstep, we know there's a product market fit. So we're going to test the software, and then in about two weeks, this week and then next week, we'll finalize the testing and make it available. Now, here's what people can expect: Brooke and I have a list of producers that we know throughout our region. We will onboard them first because we know them personally and we know that the product they are sending out is of high quality that you can trust. Many of these people will ship across the nation. So if you're listening to us and you're in New York and you're like, we're in trouble, you are, don't worry, we can ship to you. Our goal is that within the first year, we have people offering their product right to you within two day ground meaning your shipping costs go way down because they're sending it ground versus air. Ultimately, our goal is that every city and town across the nation has access to their producers just right outside their, you know, city boundaries or right right inside their own town so that shipping isn't required. Uh, that is the ultimate goal. But what we're doing here, guys, is we are changing the food supply chain that has been created since the uh, antitrust laws were were shifted by Reagan in 1980s. That's a big task. Mm -hmm. So we need you to be patient. We need you to have faith and support us that we're going to get there because every decision we are making, uh, if you haven't heard us say this already, we have been very, very cautious with the people we're putting in our circle because we are not building something to sell it. We are building something that so when we're on our deathbeds. We look at our grandkids and we say, we know that we've helped secure a food supply chain for them that can keep them healthy. And what that looks like is that they have family owned farms and ranches throughout the nation and homesteads. I don't want to forget about homesteaders. Homesteaders, you guys, frankly, are going to save our ass. Mm -hmm. There are so many of you that have moved on to small plots of land that are starting to grow food. Might seem small on your own. But in numbers, you guys are going to feed your communities because the big, we're down to 700,000 ranchers nationwide, legacy ranches, right? That's the number. We're down to about uh, just over 1% of our entire American population are producing food. Now, the homesteading movement is going to shift that and give us a buffer if we, if we ever need it. So we are building a platform to let you or to create the opportunity for you to shake the hand that feeds you. That's why it's our slogan. One of the comments we often get from fellow tinfoil hat wearing, uh, um, we're going we're gonna to start calling them what Joe Salatin calls his people. What? They're not customers. They're patron saints. Oh, I like if that. you're working with us, you are a patron saint of the producers of From the Farm. Um, but my fellow patron saints, uh, shoot. I think I lost that thought. They, they what are they, they going to do for you? Yeah, go ahead. What are they going to do for? What are those patron saints going to do for you, AJ? They're going to shake the hand that feeds them, and then a lot of these guys are. Cons you brought it back to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They say, "Well, what happens if your app goes down?" Valid question. We 
we're not doing this for any other reason than the security of our food supply chain. So let's say a worst case scenario happens and we lose that, but we have helped millions of people across the country shake the hand that feeds them. You no longer need us. And you so, share that with your neighbor. That's right. You know what yeah, I mean, yeah. if if it goes down and you've been working with working with us and you've been getting your food from a good place and all of a sudden the whole supply chain goes down, you don't cut off your neighbor just because they didn't do it. You share it with them. I want to talk share oh, your, in your community. You just y'all both y'all both just really inspire like this. When I say value for value, I really, really mean it. It is a mindset. The value for value idea. OK, if you you are creating value for your larger community by making a place for them to come together. OK, and like if it were to go down, then you feel like you've already created the value that you needed to create to shift the way that people buy and transact food all together. So everything is going to be f- producer driven in the the coming economy the co- it, the coming state of the economy which although you may believe it's going to look very similar to what it looks like right now just like a slightly tweaked version no it is going to be so different you're it's going to have its perks and it's going to have its challenges one of the challenges is you're going to have to do some of the work you're mm-hmm. going to have to be a value producer as opposed to simply a value consumer. Okay. Exactly. And one of the values that you need to, to, to consider is that like, you know, someone could, uh, the app could go down and they could operate outside of you or somebody could end up shaking the hand that feeds them. And just like a PayPal app or whatever that takes a percentage, they could go, you know, I'd rather you pay me cash and get around the system. And like, there's people that are going to be talking about that, thinking about that all the time. Totally true. And you could also consider, wow, this platform has offered me the value of possibility and that is worth voting with my dollars to support because that is ultimately how we're going to build the parallel economy where we're not dependent on the system itself to allow us, and I'm using air quotes around, allow us to participate in going to the store and buying it. If I'm going to the grocery store, the grocery store and all of the people that contributed to it have allowed me the space to buy food. Yes. But that also means that I haven't created the space for me to have other alternatives besides grocery stores. Who's responsible for that? Most people look at it and go, well, they didn't give me an option. Like, and it's like, no, I didn't give me an option. And what mm. this is doing is that it's, it's getting people involved into becoming value producers so you can receive the benefit of security. And uh, it may not be as convenient. I will give you that. Driving to Salisbury, Tennessee, for example, to go and get a whole cow as opposed to my farmer market, you know, runs every Saturday. Like, yes, it's not convenient, but man, I get so much more value from that transaction and I'm set. I know the way there. What would be better than knowing how to drive there? You helped him. You know, Mm -hmm. he's helping you. You're helping him. I think that something that's going to be very important for people that are listening, if you're not completely on board with, Um, and which is fine with the way that we perceive and the way that we believe everyone as a community needs to move forward in this endeavor. Right. And don't take this personally. I know people will, you got to let go of self. You got to let go of self. Everyone, especially nowadays and these younger generations, everyone is so focused on themselves. I'm, a, you know, I'm offended. You hurt my feelings. I need this. I want that. My life. I want it to be easier. I want the car. I want this. I, me, 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 me. The only way we survive this, and I know that's probably a little aggressive, but I have a lot of friends in places that I know that there are some very potentially terrifying things that could be on the horizon. We hope it isn't, Mm -hmm. but we're in the game of being prepared. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The only difference between thriving and surviving is your level of preparedness. And the best way, if you want to know how this works, how we are successful 
It has to be selfless. Mm -hmm. Work with us. Give us the time to fix the bugs. Send us what your, what your thing's saying. Help us help you. This is not, this is a passion project. This is something because we believe in it. And because we a hundred percent wholeheartedly believe that God has put this in our laps. Mm -hmm. This has no, this is, this is not from a place of wanting to earn or having good profit margins. It's not. So we need you to know that. And what we need in return we need that, uh, grace, patron, patron saint, grace. And, grace. and yeah, yeah. Patron saints offer grace. Yes, they, yeah. they really do. Patron saints. You know, like they, they look at, they look at eight. I mean, y'all like we're literally three recovering CrossFitters sitting on a podcast <laughs> trying to fix the food supply chain. I mean, ugh, I mean, okay. I, so, I have people reach out from the, from the rush club days and they're like, what are you doing? Well, and Brooke said the same thing on one of our shows. Like people are like, I what are y'all doing? What, like, what, does, wait, what does ag have to do? What do you have to do with ag? Well, first of all, ag is in our blood and it may not have what we, we weren't born on to a ranch. You know, we were the city slicker cousins of ranchers and we got to absorb by proximity what they did. But I'll tell you when I, and I've told this story before, when I was a kid, my cousins would tease me sometimes about being the city slicker. I hated that because my cousins were my friends and I wanted to fit in, right? Small town. My cousins were my friends. I didn't really have other friends because there were so many of us, first of all, that that's who they were. And so, you know, when they, when they tease you about that, man, it's so frustrating. I'm only in a position to help the way I can because I didn't get, I wasn't born into seeing it through this narrow field of view. I got enough exposure to understand the plight and the challenges that they faced to understand the love and the, uh, the sacredness of the, of the lifestyle of being a producer, but then lived 12 years in Phoenix, Arizona, running a gym, connecting with people that were so far removed from agriculture so that I could understand how they thought and perceived things and where their food came from, that all of a sudden as an adult, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I was given these opportunities to have the ability to communicate and bridge the gap between urban and rural. You know, this book that I'm reading about red famine, the way that it was deployed, that that actual – initiative was deployed by Lenin and Stalin was urbanites being sent to rural communities to force them to do the bidding of the leaders in the city. That's how it happened. And 7 million people starved to, starved to death in the beginning. It was the producers that starved to death because I can't remember the, the, the well, Russian way to take control. Right. Because they, because what they did was they, painted this picture of what a producer was you know producers were uh um, yeah but they called them oh shoot uh steward no worse it like like the lowest the peasant i was oh okay producers and blue collar people are peasants Mm -hmm. and so they painted they, they painted this image to the intelligentsia and this kind of goes to the the whole Satan podcast that we had. The intelligentsia were taught that they you are so much better than those lowly peasants. Go out and make them do what we want them to do. So guess what happened? In the beginning, it was the peasants that starved because they took from them first. But guess who grew the damn food for the intelligentsia? It was the peasants. So then the next wave of starvation came across the intelligentsia, the people that were sent to do the bidding. So – it is crucial. And this is something I'm becoming more and more aware of and we'll work to align ourselves with people that, that, that can reach other demographics so that they can help spread the word. We are in this together. They're, the people that want us to be against each other, especially we're in another election cycle, they want me to be against you and you to be against me. But if we sit down at the same table and we break bread together, we will find that we have far more in common. Well, and I think that right there is a great nugget for people to take away. When have, in our own lives, in a group of friends at school, have you ever let your teacher tell you who your friends are? (laughs) Yeah. 
Nope. You barely let your parents tell you who your friends are. <laughs> right. So why in the hell are, are people choosing to let the government tell us who our friends are? Mm-hmm. And yep. if, if, it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. If you are too passionate about your side, you got to reel it in. Mm-hmm. It's the only way. Yep. And believe me, I am a passionate person, dude. I am on a soapbox all the time. In fact, my heart rate is through the roof right now. <laughs> and if I had my aura ring on, we could test it, but I forgot to put it back on. Remember to breathe. <sighs> Thank you. But it is the only way. And it, it, I understand, like, I love when it comes to rodeo, when it comes to the Western lifestyle, I'm a purist. I have the hardest time seeing like pop stars making country music. Beyonce, first of all, shame on country radio. Yep. That is disgusting. They're owned by the same people. I have grown up on country radio and I have never seen that company or industry, whoever made that choice, bring so much shame to something that is so close to God and culture and nostalgia and family and hardworking people who built this country. And you just gave it away. Why? For likes? Mm-hmm. Oh, because people like to listen to her. You're going to get a lot more people on your radio, a lot more people turning in. Wow. I have zero respect for that. And it's just getting worse. And mm-hmm. when I get, I try to reel the feelings I have about being a purist about like country music or, you know, like Yellowstone came out, became a huge hit, huge fan. I loved it. But you see a lot of people that are wearing a cowboy hat that do not know what it stands for. And I find that offensive, you know? So I'm trying to reel in my puristness with that because at this point in the game, it's like, we need to, st- we need to still come together. Mm-hmm. So it's the same with our food. It's the same with your politics. Pay attention to the fact that, oh, do I want to let the government tell me who my friends are? Mm-hmm. Do I want to let them tell me who a conservative is? Yeah. Why, they're so far removed. How do they even know? You know what I mean? So let's just yep. have some, let's critical thinking. Let's bring it back. And you know what? I'm going to take a few deep breaths and you guys. Uh, <laughs> All right. So AJ said something. He said two things that uh, I want to touch on. Uh, make sure that doesn't go off. Um, one of them was about uh, the persecution of the farmers and calling them peasants. So this really hit home for me because I had a hypothesis one time that the people who were close, most closely connected to God were actually the people that worked the earth. And if you look around the world, those are the, the, the c- cultures that work the earth are the most heavily persecuted and corrupted places on earth. They're the ones that have all, I mean, I mean, I'm thinking like so many c- countries in Eastern Asia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, I've just seen, you know, especially in Thailand, I've seen some just like really like ungodly gross things. Oh, yeah. And, and the, this is where these places, uh, that these are where those types of activities fester because they're so closely connected to God that you need to corrupt those cultures and persecute the people that are the most closely connected to God. And I, I've seen it in Jamaica up close. Like they are, so that is a group of uh, a nation, a nation that is super connected to the earth. And at the same time, their culture has been so heavily corrupted to the point where people are poor and erupting with uh, violence. And I mean, I've, I've seen it first up. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that another thing you said you were so glad that you had had the, uh, in hindsight, being a city slicker that's connected tangentially. I feel the same way about being a Memphian because of its connection to the civil rights movement. Mm. And uh, most people don't know what civil rights even are. Okay. What, what the civil rights movement was about at its core, it wasn't about being treated the same. It was a, it was about being allowed to participate in the system of civics itself. So you, you and I may have different 
ways of participating, but one group of people was not allowed to participate in civics, which is uh, the relating to a city or town or a municipality like they weren't allowed to participate in the governing of their local area and that's what it was about yes of course they were fighting against the violent the undue justice and violence that was going on but really what they were fighting against was that nobody was doing anything about it because they weren't allowed to participate in the civics so most people claim civil rights now and they think like oh i want you to accept my ideology alongside these other ideologies no, you are a being as long as you're allowed to participate in the activity of civics, of being able to locally organize and impact your local environment, you are I, I, you have the ability to execute your civil rights. But most people ha- that has been twisted and warped to mean something else. You're uh, stopping my civil rights because you won't let me do something for a private company. No, as long as you have the ability to locally organize and participate in civics, you have your civil rights. You just aren't, uh, you're too lazy to participate Mm -hmm. or you don't know that participating is an option, but, um, man, I'm going to tell you the state of the municipality in the United States in the major cities, that's the problem is that people are waiting for those systems to take care of them instead of being civil and participating in civics, which means you're an active participant of your local municipality. If you are voting in the presidential election, great, you're not participating in civics in the way that you think you are. Yeah, mm-hmm. because that that action has very little to do with what happens on your day-to-day basis. So in our city, man, crime is rampant and it's because, and most people are just complaining. Why won't anybody do anything about it? It's like, why aren't you doing anything about it? Mm -hmm. Why aren't you participating in civics, locally organizing? And I, I'm of the belief that that behavior has been taught to us over generations, not to participate in that. Someone to bring you the solution. I'll just say it. We had a, a, a mayoral election recently. We have roughly 650,000 people that are allowed to vote in the municipality. How many of them do you guess voted in the Memphis mayoral election out of 650,000? 10,000. 20,000 people. Jeez. 20,000 people. <laughs> Less. You know what that is? You know what that is? That's people saying sl- someone else will do it. Yes. Someone else will do it. Yes. So, I mean, we talked about that doing from the farm. It's like, if everyone keeps sitting, waiting for someone more qualified to do it, yes. nothing's getting and done. And that's my, why that's my point. That's why I was giving y'all the, the, the I'm, I'm handing you your flowers. You're doing it with food. <laughs> this, is, this is a way to be civic and to exercise your civil rights. Food sovereignty is a, is, is a civil right in the real sense of the word. Mm-hmm. Because I can locally organize and impact my civics, my local area, by going to meet my neighbor, shaking his hand, saying thank you for your food, and now I've in- improved the uh, system in which I live, and I'm executing my civil rights, and I'm being a civilian. Yeah, and so much of this is hidden in the words, and they're words we take advantage of all the time, and that was one that I was so thankful that I have a a real grip on as a Memphian, albeit a white kid from East Memphis that didn't grow up in tough situations. I still have the, I see the lesson and, and and I see what the real lesson and takeaway was from that era and the way it's been obfuscated and used as a bargaining chip in politics is anti-civil in a way. And so I just can't thank both of you enough for, going through this together, stepping up and may actually being the people who make a difference. And it, and it just took a couple of CrossFitters. Who would have thought? <laughs> I just want to say, I'm really happy that you broke that down because if you are listening, knowing that, knowing that if we get to a point in time where that even the producers we bring to you, that that is being attacked. We need you, man. 
Mm-hmm. That's the only way we can fight back. We, we've talked about lobbyists. We've talked about all the shit that's coming. And we're trying to figure out the best way to, you know, get this get this up and going before anyone has a chance to try and come at us. But the best, best backup plan we're going to have is our community, is our producers, is our consumers knowing their civil right. And when we call on you, don't wait for someone else to do it. Okay? This is the last line. And I know that sounds a little extreme, but it is. Yep. And we need you. That's right. I'll say a couple things in closing. Protect your Second Amendment. Get real good with a gun. And shake the hand that feeds you. And if you can do that, then we can have a shot to make this ship turn around. And that is episode 16 of the, for now, Feed the People podcast. I'm your producer, Brooks. I'm here with Brooke Entz and AJ Richards. As we've said, a couple of CrossFitters just out there doing God's work. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Thank you both for doing it. And thank you, the producer, for listening to this show. And we look forward to catching up with you for episode 17 coming next week. And really look forward to launching that From the Farm app, aligning it with the podcast, and helping you shake the hand that feeds you. We'll see you next week.